for some streamers. All right, we're streaming. All right, so we are we are comfortable with three one. That's what I understand. Mm -hmm. All right, so then we'll do three two. Okay, uh, let's go to a good drive. I think we pretty much hit everything we need to hit uh, on solids. And again, when we're talking about solids, we're primarily talking, again, a, like a proxy for intermolecular forces. So the stronger intermolecular forces you have, the higher the melting point is going to be. So, you know, with the liquids, boiling point. Uh, in solids, melting point. So, uh, which is polystructure structure most likely to be a solid at room temperature. So, again, proxy for uh, for intermolecular forces, which of these would have the stronger intermolecular force? And this is actually kind of neat because uh, this is, these are uh, fatty, fatty, basically solids. Um, okay. These are fats and this is called a saturated fat, and this is an unsaturated fat. If you uh, look at your, your chips, it says polyunsaturated or saturated or unsaturated. Saturated means that all of the carbon to carbon bonds are single bonds. That's what saturated means. Unsaturated means there's some double bonds somewhere in there. So you can answer this in terms of intermolecular attraction to say, well, this whole uh, this whole polar section down here and this whole relatively non-polar section down here, this saturated non-polar section is going to lead this to be more solid. This unsaturation here is going to lead this to be more uh, liquid or less solid. So and in fact, that's actually what it is. Vegetable oil has unsaturations. Uh, animal oils are usually fully saturated, which is why lard and bacon is a solid at room temperature, whereas vegetable oil is a liquid at room temperature. And when they sac when they hydrogenate something, they basically put this uh, this liquid oil under high pressure hydrogen, and it breaks this double bond, plugs into hydrogens, and it takes a liquid at room temperature oil and turns it into a solid at room temperature oil. That's called a trans fat, which people are like trans fats are bad. They probably are, of course, all pretty much all solid fats are bad for you. But uh, this liquid oil, like corn oil, comes out as a liquid at room temperature because of the unsaturation. And then we hydrogenate it, turn it into a trans fat, and it becomes a solid at room temperature because of the saturation. Still FYI. It's one of those things that hopefully you'll take with you. This is saturated, unsaturated. But how do you hydrogenate it? Do you add hydrogen? Yeah, at high pressure. So if you take this. If you take the, it's super, super, super easy. You just take this liquid oil and put it under extremely high pressure with hydrogen environment, and the hydrogen will bond into the double bond, crack the double bond, and then that become a single bond, two hydrogens bond to it, and it becomes a saturated <coughs> fat. That's how they do saturated. That's how they do saturated fats. Then they cook your Doritos in it. So they heat it up and it liquefies, and then they cook your Doritos in it. When it cools down in your bag, it becomes a solid. So your Doritos aren't, aren't squishy and wet. Like French fries. Um, French fries are usually cooked in vegetable oil, not like anything else, vegetable oil. That's why they get they make the bag all greasy, because that vegetable oil doesn't turn back into a solid. It stays yeah. as a liquid. So yeah, fun little fun fact about life. Life is fun. Yeah. So and it's just and in terms of intermolecular forces, you have more uh, polarity, if you will with the saturated compound. You have your partial negative down here, you have your partial positive-ish down here. So you have stronger dipoles with the saturated fat, weaker dipoles with the unsaturated fat. Cool. All right. Okay, this is a heating curve. And uh, this is, there used to be an AP lab where we did this, but we don't do it anymore. Um, but what happens, one of the things we talked about last year when we talked about thermo thermochemistry, is when you melt something, all the energy goes into the phase change. So if you have some ice at negative 10 degrees and you start heating it, it cannot melt until it reaches its melting point. And that's pretty much the case for every solid. It has to reach its melting point, then the additional heat goes to the phase change, then you can heat it up some more. So what you see here is this would be, here, I'm going to annotate here. If 
you're to look at this graph, let's just pretend it's ice. We don't know if it's ice or not, it's just some pure substance. But uh, what you have here is ice, and then you heat it to its melting point. So right there, so this would be zero degrees, and this would be 100 degrees. So you get your solid, you heat it up, that warms it up, and then during the phase change, there is no temperature change, okay? Because all of the heat that is going into it is going into the phase change, okay? And then we've, this is the phase change right here, and then this is warming, so we warm to zero degrees, there's a phase change, then we warm to 100 degrees, and then this is the phase change of water to gas. In other words, the, the liquid to solid, or liquid to gas phase change. Okay. Does this idea make sense? Okay, so um, you can go through this and yeah, but that's how you read these, these heating graphs. You do heating, phase change, heating, phase change. And if we were in physics, we would, do, we would add math to it, but we're not in physics. We just care about the generalness of the thing. Okay. How much do we have left? I think there's like seven questions. Yeah, you're doing all of them. So. Uh, explain why the standard enthalpy of vaporization values for each set of compounds are not the same. In other words, as a proxy, intermolecular forces as a proxy again. So standard enthalpy of vaporization that is the heat required to vaporize something. Okay. So standard enthalpy of vaporization is just the heat required to vaporize something. And it is, once again, a proxy for intermolecular forces. So why are they not the same? And what I'd really like to do is talk about which one would be higher, uh, which one would have stronger intermolecular forces so they have higher uh, vaporization. Okay, are we good? It feels like you're... And then number four, explain why the boiling point of water decreases as elevation increases. Okay, this has to do with the pressure part of, uh, of solubility. So imagine you got a beaker of water, you got your beaker of water, and you want to get some gas molecules <coughs> into the solution. You have to put those under pressure to get the gas molecules into the solution. And then if you want to get them out of solution, you heat it up and, and they push back. So you heat it up and they push back. So what are they pushing back against? When you heat up liquid and what, first of all, what are the bubbles when you boil something? You have some water in a pot and you, you're going to make spaghetti or macaroni and cheese. Uh, what are the bubbles coming up? What are they? Um, hot air. CO2. Glad I mentioned that. Um, so you're going to heat it up. And bubbles are going to come up. What happens when you heat up water? You get gas. Yes. What gas? H2O. H2O. So what are those bubbles made out of? Yes. Gas. H2O. Yeah. H2O gas. Exactly. It's just gas is H2O. Water. Yeah. Um, so what frequently happens in the ocean is there's underground volcanoes that create a tremendous amount of steam, but we don't see the steam reach to the surface because as the, the gas reaches the top, it starts forming back into liquid as it cools down. And that's what would happen. If you imagine you have a pot of macaroni and cheese and your pot was this big, it would boil down here and this would be calm up here. Because the bubbles would boil, they form the gaseous uh, steam would form, but then it would just turn, it would condense right back into a liquid on the way back up. So yeah, it's uh, it's just gaseous H two O. So um, that's really important. Yeah, so gaseous H two O is formed, and they're going up. So what is keeping it from going up? What is keeping water? Like if I put water in a in a beaker, what's keeping the water from boiling right now? Nothing. It's got heat. The intermolecular forces? That definitely helps, yeah. So the intermolecular forces are holding the molecules together, but they do want to reach the top. In fact, I'm going to show you a fun little trick. Um, I should get some, no, I'll, I'll skip the food coloring. Uh, I'm, going to boil, I'm going to get this warm, but it's not going to be boiling. I'm going to show you a fun little trick. You happen to have a couple syringes.
impress and impress your friends and instill fear in your enemies. So what's happening when something boils is the gas, the solution, is releasing gas molecules into the air. And it happens all the time. So one of the questions I would ask you is, I just spilled some water on uh, the, I, I spilled some water on the counter. Everything in this room, is at, except for you and I, is at 71 degrees Fahrenheit, which is not nearly the boiling point of water. Is that water going to evaporate? Yeah, right? It's going to evaporate. Um, but what's the boiling temperature of water? 100 degrees Celsius. Yeah, 100 degrees Celsius. Is that water at 100 degrees Celsius? No. So how could it possibly evaporate? Because like some of them are hot for some reason, but I don't remember why. I remember watching a film that I video. Yeah, where it was like some of them do get like an, enough energy to like pop up like, into the gaseous the temperature state. Temperature of something is like the average of all of the different atoms. That's exactly right. Yeah. So um, when you look at temperature, what you're really looking at is what's called the distribution of uh, of molecules, energies. So you look at the average, and that's going to be the temp, and this is going to be the percent of basically, or you know, the number. Let's just say no percent, percent of molecules. Um, no, actually, this is back over here. The percent of the molecules is over here, and the energy is right here. So in any sample of a uh, liquid, you have some that have right reached the boiling point, and you have some that have reached the freezing point. It's just you, you don't see it because there are so few, okay? And then you heat things up, then you can shift it over, and eventually, if this temperature, if so many of them are reaching into the, the boiling point, and, and then they'll actually, the, the gas molecules will stick together and form bubbles. Okay? And that's what you see when you say, oh, it's boiling. It's like, well, technically, it's always boiling. It's just there's not enough that we can actually see it boil. Watch what happens when you take some warm water. Okay, watch this. Ready for this? It's just gonna keep going. No, eventually it will fill up the space above the, it'll fill up the gas above it. But what's it doing? Boiling? It's boiling. Um, because the pressure changed. Exactly. So what keeps something from boiling? The atmospheric pressure is pushing down on the molecules that want to get out of the gas phase. If you take that atmospheric pressure away, then even just normal warm water will, will boil. In fact, if I was to expose this, if I was to expose this to the vacuum of space, this would boil. And uh, we actually have anecdotal data there was a guy, I think he was in the Air Force, might have been in the Navy, but it was a, it was a military guy, and uh, he was accidentally exposed to a, an almost entire vacuum. And what he described, first of all, I shut his eyes because he knew something was wrong, but what he described was um, a fizzing noise and a fizzing feeling on his tongue. His saliva was boiling. Yeah, because there's, there's, there was enough energy in his saliva and his body temperature and without the without the pressure pushing back on it then uh, that's what happens your eyes will do that if you're ever exposed to a partial vacuum shut your eyes because otherwise your eyes will do that too because you have a lot of warm fluids in your eyes that would love to boil that's the freaky part of just uh, in but, case you're ever exposed to yeah. a partial vacuum like, just in case you happen to find yourself exposed to a, a near partial near vacuum make sure you close your eyes just like you know or wear a helmet like Star Wars. Okay. Okay. So anyway, um, so back to the original question: Why does the boiling point of water decrease as elevation increases? The pressure is because uh, the pressure decreases as elevation less. increases. Okay, so it's half of it. So as you increase your elevation, there's less gas above you pushing down on you. So there's less pressure. Is there less gravity? 
Uh, not really. Okay. Yeah. One of the things we learn in physics is the gravitational field around the Earth extends far, far, far beyond what we would consider space. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's you get about where we are right now. You get about 99.5 percent of normal gravity because we're you know 2,500 feet. Uh, and even when you get down where the International Space Station is, you're still looking at about 95 percent of normal gravity. So you have to go really far away before gravity starts to fall off. Mm -hmm. um, so no, there's not more gravity, but there's more. There's more. There's less air on top of you, which means less pressure, which means what about these gas molecules? They uh, mm -hmm. go up easier because they're not being pushed down as much. They require less energy to overcome the, pre the mm -hmm. atmospheric pressure. Yeah, okay. that's, that's what I meant. Yeah. So right, so with less atmospheric pressure, it's going to require less kinetic energy for the molecules to overcome that push down force. So they're going to be like, we're out of here, and they go out. Does the water have to be heated for that one? Yes, because this is limited. That the, I'm limited in what kind of pressure I can create with my syringe. Um, so I can get this down to about a tenth of an atmosphere, um, but that requires temperature to be in the neighborhood of like 50 or 60 Celsius. Mm -hmm. So it's not so hot that I can't put my, well, it's actually, this is actually pretty hot. Um, this is probably about 70 or 80 Celsius. Um, but you can actually do this. I usually do this at about 50 or 60 where I put my finger in it. And then go like, oh, look at that, that's boiling. And they're like, it's boiling, you put a finger in it. Yeah. So I, I am limited in, in the pressure, in the vacuum I can create in the, the syringe itself. But that doesn't make the water hot, right? Mm -hmm. It's boiling? Correct. Yeah. The, so the, that's why the water like, stays the same temperature. But it's just uh, a lower boiling point. Yes. Correct. Yes. Okay. I forced the boiling point down because the pressure went down. Yeah. Why didn't burn the guy, the Air Force guy? Uh, why didn't it burn him? It didn't burn it because it's boiling at a low temperature. Correct. Yeah. So this, his saliva was boiling um, at body temperature, mm -hmm. you know, 37 degrees Celsius. Yeah. Did you know body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius? Well, it's not it is. It's 37 degrees Celsius, and a fever is considered to be 38. And if you get to 40 degrees Celsius, <coughs> that's where you, where you encounter heat stroke. Kind of nice. 37, 38, 40. Instead of 98.6, 99 99.5, 102. Oh God. <laughs> Is Celsius like smaller, um, like going from 37 to 38? Is that a larger increment than like 100 to 101? Yes. <laughs> um, no, no, not from 100 to 101. No, it's a it's a bigger increment. So. Um, for instance, yeah, like if you're just gonna go from up one number in Celsius versus in Fahrenheit, yes, it's a bigger increment. Okay. It is a bigger increment. Yeah, so it's uh, a single degree Celsius is a bigger than a single degree. A single degree Celsius is bigger than a single degree Fahrenheit. Okay. All right. And they can do a pure sample of HBr is a higher vapor pressure than a pure sample of KBr, and then create visible or Visual representations to show interaction between the particles in both samples during vaporization. Um, they love doing these. In fact, I would be surprised if this was not in one of your quizzes for this unit. Visual representations are particle diagrams. So HBr, this is a this is a covalent compound. So you're going to show this as HBr with its unshared pairs. So that's a covalent compound. Right? Um, and then you probably want to show it with its dipole too. So you got some options. You can show it with a dipole. You can show it with electron density. I would do the dipole. Um, but if you want to do like an electron density, you can do that as well. There's more electron density around bromine. Okay. And it is the ionic compounds that usually get people. Okay. With an ionic compound, you have to remember that you're talking about a positive charge that's attracted to a negative charge, okay? If you want to put in the dots, it gives you a better argument. So I would do something like that. And then as far as how you do these, um, how you do their attractions, it's entirely up to you. Um, usually you just show them like this. Just positive, negative. Positive, stack, attractive, negative. So this one. This one be ionic. This one be polar covalent. 
And since it's polar covalent, you got what kind of intermolecular forces with ionic compounds? Um, uh, London dispersion. Yeah, so there's some London dispersion, but more importantly, there is ionic attraction. So you got ionic attraction uh, for the KBR and London dispersion forces. What kind of uh, intermolecular forces for the HBR? Is it dipole dipole? Yeah, dipole dipole, and London forces. Tiny bit of London dispersion forces, mostly dipole dipole. Does hydrogen only not have a charge? Uh, right, it doesn't. Yeah. Is it because hydrogen just essentially has no electrons? It's a covalent compound. So covalent compounds don't have charges. Oh, okay. Anyway. The individual atoms have formal charges, but the the uh, the whole molecule does not have okay. a, a charge. Remember formal charges? Yes. Okay. How many electrons come in? How many electrons come out? So zero, seven minus seven, one minus one, total zero. And then KBR, the potassium gives off its electron to bromine. You have a negative one charge because it comes in with six and leaves with eight. This one comes in with one and leaves with zero. So formal charge of one and negative one. And formal charge of zero. Okay. All right. Um, so I will leave, explain why the explain why the vapor pressure of H bar is higher than the vapor pressure of KBR. Um, I wouldn't okay, vapor pressure. So vapor pressure is that diagram with the liquids having the gas forcing them away into the atmosphere. Solids don't have vapor pressure. They just don't. Liquids have vapor pressure. So liquid at room temperature, vapor pressure, solid room temperature, no vapor pressure. It's just that simple. Okay, how are we doing so far? What are the main factors that account for the extreme hardness of diamond? Um, this is something you probably want to look up. I don't want to give you the answer, I want you to look that up. That up. Because it is, it is a pretty cool um, principle and about uh, covalent compounds. And then what substance in each side has the highest melting point, just by your answer, using chemical principles? So you've got two, you have a, uh, an ionic compound and a covalent compound. So let's, you know, I don't think we've talked about this point. So let's go ahead and approach this and talk about the types of solids that we can have. I can't remember how much of the solids we have talked about. So let's go ahead and talk about solids. did talk about it previously last week we talked about how ionic solids the reason they're fragile is you you cause them to shatter when their ions re reach a, a repulsive force so this is attractive propulsive attractive propulsive you shatter it and becomes repulsive repulsive so it crack and then molecular solids okay when you melt ions you get this situation okay, where the ions become all gooey and what I'm looking for is covalent network solids I want, there's the saturated fat and saturated fat thing. I want, and there's the heating curve, molecular liquids. We talked about that. I want to talk about molecular covalent solids. Got to be in here. Vapor pressure of ionic solids. They don't have one um, because of the strong. Oh, here we go. Covalent network solids. All right. So a covalent network solid is one of the craziest ideas. And diamond is one gigantic molecule where each carbon atom is, is, is connected to three others. So it's one gigantic molecule. That's a covalent network solid. It is exceptionally strong. Okay. Um, well, hard, depending on the configuration. So um, graphite is another situation where you have a single atom of carbon bound to, to uh, three others in a different configuration. They're kind of planar, they're, they're like sheets. Um, so that's graphite. Diamond, they're all tetrahedral. Yeah, so there we go. And this is, is this the end? 
And then quartz. Okay, so SiO2 is what it's talking about. Co SiO2 is a covalent network solid of, uh, of silicon and oxygen. Like silicon, oxygen, silicon, oxygen, silicon, oxygen, silicon, oxygen. And it actually comes up and makes extra bonds. Uh, so every silicon atom is covalently bonded to four oxygen atoms. Every oxygen atom is covalently bonded to two silicon atoms. So that SiO2 is propagated throughout the crystal, and there is a whole bunch of silicon bonded to oxygen, bonded to oxygen, bonded to oxygen. That oxygen bonded to that silicon, and that silicon down there, that oxygen, and it basically just makes this gigantic, uh, gigantic, gigantic molecule, which is extremely strong. And oh, proteins, we will not be tested on proteins. This is probably just an old <coughs> biomolecules, synthetic polymers. Uh, polymers are no longer in the, uh, polymers are no longer in the test, but basically how a polymer works is you just shear off one end of the molecule and stick another one on there. So that's how you make polymers. Um, but uh, not on there. <coughs> Metallic solids. Um, no, that's not. Uh, metals, of course, is metals are. So metallic bonding, we talked about the electron C last year and this year. All the electrons are shared amongst each other because the D orbitals are, they overlap with each other. Uh, did we talk about alloys, interstitial and substitutional alloys? Yeah. Okay, cool. So you understand that, and I think that's it. Okay. So again, I, I like my PowerPoint more than this, but I just want to make sure we covered the covalent network solids. Okay, questions? then I think we covered everything we need to cover for this. So KCL is ionic, silicon dioxide is a covalent network solid. <coughs> Ammonia is covalent, and diamond is a covalent network solid. That's pretty much the creme de la creme of strength is a covalent network solid. All right, so that is that. All right, next. Good time. All right, three, two, so I'll look in the gas, another short one. Okay, um, so now basically this takes into account everything we've been doing so far in three, three, and then three, four, uh, we will be talking about gases tomorrow, okay? Uh, gases is pretty much an entire, it's all review of the first year, but because we had COVID, I'm gonna try to, like, okay, let's, talk, let's do gases again slowly, you know, go through it so we remember how gases work, PV equals NRT, uh, PV over T and uh, one half MV squared equals one half MV squared. But in the meantime, let's do three three solids, liquids, and gases. All right. Um, identical types of motion that individual molecules can undergo in a molecular solid. Um, they can't rotate over each other. There's pretty much all, only thing type, type of motion they can do for uh, a molecular solid is some sort of vibration, some sort of stretching, if you will. When the temperature of a solid copper pipe increases, I can fix that. No, it's powder. Oh, can I fix it? No, it's powder. Oh, yeah, cool. It's PDF. Or it's uh, not a PDF, it's stock. Cool. When the temperature of a solid copper pipe increases, does the motion of the free electrons increase, decrease, or remain the same? Wow. Okay, let's talk about that. One of the fun things you find out in physics, and they've been using this for a hundred years to heat your house, is that heated metals they expand and their resistance to electron flow increases. <coughs> Maybe we won't. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Maybe we won't. Let's go back to it. There we go. All right. Okay. Um, so, solids, we learned about solids a bunch last year. They're close together. They're held together by chemical bonds. All they do is vibrate, but they do have to still move. Okay. Solids do have to still move. And the characteristic of a solid is when the intermolecular forces are much larger than the kinetic energy. Okay. Characteristics of gas is when the kinetic energy is much larger than intermolecular forces. And then, of course, there's different types of solids. Amorphous literally means uh, no set shape, no crystalline shape. 
glass is an amorphous solid. There is tons of different ways you can make glass because when you take the silicon and the oxygen that would be quartz and you turn it into glass, how you cool it down has a lot to do with whatever configuration it will be. If you cool it down over tens of thousands or millions or billions of years, depending on how you subscribe to the universe, then you'll get a quartz configuration. Um, if you cool it down very, very fast, you'll get this gooey, this gooey plasticky uh, glass that will cool down into almost any shape you want. Okay. Um, so that's amorphous, where there's no set orderly structure. You can just basically make them fix them in position, make them flow however they want, let it cool down, let them harden however they want. So glass chemistry is a big deal. There's, you know, you can make a lot of money in glass chemistry. You're like, I want to make this kind of glass for the auto industry. I want to make this kind of glass for the beer bottle. I want to make this kind of glass for beakers. Um, I want to make this kind of glass for uh, cell phone screens. How you treat the glass, how you cool it down, how you heat it up, what chemicals you put in it, changes everything. It's pretty much the, it's, it's pretty much the most exciting ke uh, chemical that we have. You can do so much with it. Uh, crystalline solids. So we talked about crystalline solids. They have what's called a unit cell. That is the, the formula unit, basically the simplified unit of the uh, of the structure. Okay. So quartz ionic solids like NaCl. It's Na. Oh, here you go. <coughs> NaCl. So this is a formula unit. This is a a crystalline structure of NaCl, and the formula unit would just be an Na and a Cl multiple, multiplied multiple times. I love 3D printing. I've been using science. Okay, so there's your amorphous solid glass. It's amorphous. Quartz is crystalline. Okay, so there's liquids, volumes. For the most part, there are very, very, very few uh, solids that become more dense when they cool down. In other words, when you heat them up, the heating them up usually makes something more uh, less dense. Okay, so ice is slightly larger in volume and gallium as well. When you heat up, when you freeze water into ice, it expands and becomes less dense. When gallium freezes into its crystal form, it expands and becomes less dense. Most things, when they cool down and expand, they become more dense, like iron. Uh, most metals, when they harden, they became, become less dense, but not ice and not gallium. And normally when you heat something up, they spread out. Oh, uh, pressure. Wow, okay, this is already, we're already floating into the gas law area. Um, kinetic energy molecules. Okay, so this is all gases. Okay. What was the question that I wanted to that I wanted to address? Oh, I forgot. Um, it says. When the temperature of a solid copper pipe increases, does the motion of the free electrons increase, decrease, or remain the same? Okay. That's a good question. Um, well, when the when okay, so when you heat a metal up, the electrons have to, if you will, move further to get to the next atom. So you can remember we talked about D block electrons, they overlap each other. And the, so you got the D block atoms and electrons go from here to here to here to here to here. They basically overlap. So when you heat them up, now they start vibrating a little bit and that vibration will cause the electrons to slow down a little bit. Okay. So one of the things we find out in physics is a hotter piece of metal will have more resistance to electron flow. And this is how the, the thermostat in your house works. There's a tiny wire that has voltage running across it. And when it gets warmer, that tiny wire uh, has increased resistance and it tells the computer, oh, if my resistance is 0.1, then I'm gonna turn my air conditioner off. If it's 0.5 or 0.11, if it's a higher resistance, I'm gonna turn my air conditioner on. Does that make sense? So that wire is hotter, has more resistance, I'll turn my air conditioner off. Or if my wire suddenly has lower resistance, I'll turn the heater on. So hotter metals have more vibration that slows their electrons down, the electron flow down. Does that idea make sense? I thought it would be in here, but it's not in here. But that's why. <coughs> Maybe you should put it in here. Why didn't you do that? Maybe that skipped over. Did I skip over it? Nope. I don't think so. 
think I skipped over there. So, okay. yeah. Does it, um, so if a metal gets hot, mm -hmm. the electrons move less? Yeah, they flow from one end to the other and slower because they have to go from atom to atom to atom to atom. And it's kind of like, imagine that you were walking across the river and the bridge is just straight across. Like, no problem, I just walk right across. Then imagine the bridge becomes a zigzag or there's gaps in the bridge. You're gonna be a little more careful because now you have to move between different atoms. Okay. Same kind of thing. So as you have heated up the atoms, they spread apart, they move around a little more. That slows the flow of electrons from one end to the other. Another thing, there's a, at the extreme example, um, superconducting materials are as cold as you can get them. Eventually, you lock those materials in place so well because they're so cold, the electrons can go from one atom to the next atom to the atom, next atom, effectively, effectively near the speed of light with very little resistance. So you can imagine you're an electron on this lobe, you want to get to this lobe, but the atom's kind of going like this. Okay. And if you speed them up, now they're going a lot further, it's going to take longer to get from one atom to the other atom. When you get superconducting situations, they just kind of fix into position and the atoms move together. So it's very easy to go from there to there. Yeah. So like, when you have a light in a room and it overheats, it's because like the electron or the metal overheats and the electrons can't flow as well? Is that yeah. what it turns off? Yep. Okay. Yeah. In fact, um, have you noticed with it's not a big deal with LEDs, but maybe you noticed it. Maybe you were old enough. Incandescent bulbs, that's the one with a little wire. Right. They always pop when you turn them on. Yeah. And the reason they always pop when you turn them on is they are cold to begin with. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, there's a massive rush of electricity. And uh, I'll just go ahead and give you the, give you the little physics, because why not? And so there's a formula called V equals IR. It's the application of Ohm's law. So you're hitting that thing with 110 volts and you have a very small resistance. That means you're gonna get a very large current through it. So a whole bunch of current gets blasted through. Current is the flow of electrons. So current is the flow of electrons. So when you turn on the, the, the light bulb, the light bulb is very cold. So it has very low resistance. You're gonna get a big current. And eventually, if it's made well, then there's a little circuit so the resistance warms up as it gets hot and you get a smaller current from that same 110, same, same 110 volts. Okay. So the reason old light bulbs always pop right when you turn them on is because the resistance in that filament is very small. There's a big blast of current through it. And that kind of like, that, that will wear out the, the light bulb. So in fact, there is, there is a theory back when we used to all use incandescents before you were born. Um, that you should just leave your lights on. If you just leave your lights on, then you never encounter this because the wire will stay warm. Mm -hmm. And uh, we used to heat buildings with light bulbs, and not in, not in Vegas certainly, but in like Chicago, New York, you know, uh, even even somewhere. Yeah. So anyway, where it was normally very cold, the businesses would just leave all their lights on because the lights themselves would heat the building, and you wouldn't want to turn them on or off because you turn them off. The building would get cold, and you have these really cold filaments. You turn the lights on, and they don't pop. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Would they eventually like burn out? The light yes, <laughs> but slower than than if you just left them all on. Yeah. So that was the thing. By turning your light bulbs on and off, you wear them out. Mm -hmm. And your parents, I would bet, because your parents were your age thirty years ago or forty years ago, I would bet that they were told to not turn lights on and off. It's like, you're gonna wear them out if you turn them on and off. So, you know, just leave them on. Because um, that's a, an artifact of incandescent bulbs. Yeah. Nowadays, LEDs work exactly the same. LEDs love being turned on and off. Because yeah. um, they work exactly the opposite way. They work on the, on the quantum on the quantum idea with LEDs. When you turn them on or off, um, it, it, or their resistance doesn't matter. So that's why LEDs can be turned on and off faster than our eyes can see. I mean, it's going on right now. This LED is not turning on full blast all the time. It's constantly turning on and off, particularly 30 times a second. So it's going on off, on off 30 times a second, and you don't even notice it. Um, but that's how LEDs work. Yeah, you could not you could not run computers on incandescent bulbs. Uh, and then these guys are turning on and off at 60 times a second. Is that why computers have like 
like <coughs> may give you headaches sometimes or something. Mm-hmm. And we have like it's the blue light or something. It's two different things. Okay. Um, so the frame rate, basically how often it's being turned on and off. If you if you are if the frame rate is close to you noticing it, then your brain will try to catch up. Um, so I'm not I'm not a neurologist. I just know a little bit about it, just a little bit, just a little bit to be dangerous. Um, so if you're looking at something like 30 frames per second, like an Xbox, an old Xbox will be just displaying at 30 times frames a second. Your brain will know that it's not quite fast enough, and it'll try to keep up. Um, and that's what happens with movie theaters. Um, they had to switch to a, a special kind of bulb because when they started projecting digitally instead of film, like light through a film, and they started projecting digitally at 24 frames per second, people were like, that looks really strange because the light was able to turn on and off that fast and our brains were able to see it. Um, and that's also why when you see something that's like 60 frames per second or 120 frames per second, it looks weird, it looks too smooth because you're not used to it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's why you get, that's why you get you can get eye strain from a monitor that is refreshing too slowly. Um, so you should never use a monitor that refreshes less than 60. And professionals usually use monitors that up for that monitor that refresh about 100 or 120 times a second. So mine's a 120th, and I love, I can actually tell. Like I come here and I see these that are refreshing at 60. I go, oh, I see that that's refreshing at 120. I'm like, yeah, that's like double, definitely double the difference. Mm-hmm. Some of your monitors, some of your laptops only do 30. Yeah. And you're like, this looks terrible. You mm-hmm. can't explain why. It's because your brain knows that it should be, your brain's trying to catch up with the frame rate yeah. and it's working too hard. Mm-hmm. Once it gets to a certain amount, usually 30 or 40, <clears throat> for most people, for teenagers, probably 40 or 50, because your eyes are, your brains are faster. You mm-hmm. process the information, visual information faster than I do. So once you get to about 50 frames a second, your brain just says, I'm not even gonna try anymore. Mm-hmm. The blue light thing is a little bit different. That's that's primarily just uh, eye strain, that's chemical eye strain. You're, you're, it, it takes more chemicals to see blue light mm-hmm. um, than it does to see like yellows and reds. Mm-hmm. And we are really good at seeing blues and greens. We're crazy good at it. <clears throat> so we devote a large portion of our ment- our visual acuity to seeing blues and greens. No, that's the other way. We're really bad at seeing blues and greens. So we have to use more of our brain to see blues and greens. Uh-huh. We're really good at yellow- yellows and reds. So it's like, if someone Will the frames per second keep getting bigger and bigger because our brains will adjust to it? Or is there a certain point where our brains just like... Good question. <laughs> keep probably, um, but uh, probably, but I don't know. That's I'm not an evolutionary biologist. Um, <laughs> one would think if if people who are really good, if, if, if only like professional video gamers and aircraft pilots ha- were able to procreate, then probably. Mm-hmm. But since you can procreate and be terrible at video games, yeah, probably not. <laughs> yeah, they, there's actually this is one of the cool things they. This is my hobby of mine. Um, so fighter pilots, their brains can make. I'm going I'm to slaughter the numbers, but six to ten decisions per second. So they can like look at a bunch of information. Though that's that that object on my screen is going that far, that thing my radar is going here, I need to move this, this. They can make six to 10 per second. Mm -hmm. Um, You and I, untrained, can usually do about three to four per second, which is not bad. Um, Professional video gamers, like at 17, 19 years old, can usually make eight to 12 per second. So their brains are actually moving faster than fighter pilots who've been basically flying at the extremely high speed for 30 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Uh, yeah, they're just, they're crazy fast and they, you know, like when you're playing a video game, you see these, these kids playing video games professionally. They, it, it doesn't even look like their eyes aren't even tracking. Their eyes are taking all the information in and they're just doing this. They're not even looking on the screen because they see everything. And it's just, they're, That's right. they're not like, we're, we're like, when we play, we're like, oh. Yeah, like whenever I play Minecraft, I'm like, okay, I need to zoom out. Like, I get so confused. <laughs> like, I can't. <laughs> Same. Video games are so hard for me. Yeah, I used to be. When I was your, when I was your age, um, I was I was a bit of a predator in in, in video games, and now I can't even keep. I, I could twenty year old me would kick my butt just thoroughly because I mean I used to have video game clubs. Yeah. I can't do it. My brother can, but not me. Yeah. 
when I was when I was at Spring Valley with a video game club, and I was wiped the floor with them. I was like 25. <laughs> now I can possibly. Alexa, stop. Okay, uh, particular representation. So it's particular, 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 particular. So everything is particular representations. Um, the most important thing about particular representations is how many you have and how close they are. Okay, so draw a particular representation of molecular liquid at a low temperature and a high temperature. So this would be if you're the same thing, low temperature, high temperature, same number of molecules, be further apart. Okay, and it says velocity vectors. Um, I haven't seen velocity vectors on the AB test, but if you do velocity vectors, basically, you know what velocity means, right? Just, it's a speed or something. something. Exactly. <laughs> it's speed with a direction. So velocity is speed with a direction. So you'd have a low uh, low temperature might look like that, and a high temperature might look like that. That's all you have to do for velocity vectors. Longer vector means faster molecule. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, particular vector gas at low temperature, high pressure, or low temperature, high pressure. Oh, we did that. What? Molecular gas, molecular liquid. Oh. Okay, so here's the thing about a liquid. Um, they have to be close together. So liquids flow over each other, gases are far apart. That's the difference between three and four. And then one liter sample of molecular gas in a cylinder draw a second particular of the same sample after it's been compressed to 0.5 liters. So you have a gas, you press it, what's the molecule going to look like? You know, you compress it, they're going to be closer together. Okay. Um, assume temperature remains the same. So this will actually pop up. This remains the same. That means your velocity vectors have to be the same length, okay? Because temperature varies with one half mass velocity squared. So if you have the same temperature, you have to have the same velocity for the same gas. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Should you find yourself where you have, again, we'll talk about this in gas, when we do gas later. If you have a very small mass, it's gonna have a big velocity. If you have a very large mass, it's going to have a small velocity. This is Graham's law. We did do Graham's law last year, but basically, if you have two samples of gas at the same temperature, one has a smaller mass, it's going to have a big velocity, bigger mass, smaller velocity, then you would have like gas one has a small velocity and gas two has a big velocity. Okay. So when they're looking for particle diagrams, they're looking for how close they are together and how big that vector is, and then, yeah, that sets our movement. And then drop particle shows the difference between a solid, liquid, and gas. Oh, geez. Yeah, you can figure that out. Particle motion, intermolecular force, and overall volume must be highlighted in their presentation. Don't know what they mean by that, because that's going to be tricky. But solid, boop. Liquid, boop. Gas, boop. <coughs> so you can handle these. Um, does particulate representation just mean a model? Mm -hmm. okay. Ball model. Atoms, molecules as balls. And it's probably, um, you'll see when we do tests in the spring, it's a big deal. The college board loves doing particle models um, because they, it's, it's the principle that if you can draw something, you understand it more than, or if you can draw something, you understand it. That's basically it. So if you can draw a particle model, you understand what's going on at the molecular level. So um, that's pretty much the most popular thing going right now with the college board. All right, cool. So we will do gases tomorrow. So try to get as much of these worksheets done as you can. I realize it's a lot of work, but we need to get back on track. And um, this is not, it's a lot of busy work, but it's not a lot of knowledge work. What the? End stream. I'm live. Oh, there I am. I was like, have I not been recording this whole time? I hope I've been recording this whole time. Oh, well, whatever. Yeah, the time.